Good morning. Good morning. A great day the Lord has made today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, holy is your precious name. I love it, Lord, when we sing hymns. I was, uh, as you know, and by way of letting those who are listening to me know, uh, I was singing your praises while working the other day. Just couldn't get enough of you. I pray that all those who love you on occasion and as much as possible do those things, Lord. And I should be doing a lot more. For you have saved my soul. You have given your life. And free at that. And I thank you for it, Lord. Forgive me my sins. Forgive all of our sins. Bless all those who love you. Let us understand this very faith that we're called to have, that we're commanded to never let go of, to continue in until you come and get us or until the rapture. Either way, we'll be raptured. And we'll be with you, Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with you. Your word clearly declares. And we thank you for that, Lord. Be with all persecuted ones of our body. We're connected in such a way to each other that if someone hurts, we're hurting. If someone is rejoiceful, we're rejoicing. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to, as we did last week when I spoke about the doing and uh, the doing of our faith and that our faith is not enough by itself as per James and other scriptures. I'm going to highlight faith itself today. I've talked about it many times and of course faith is the very kingpin of our salvation while it is given by God free of charge, it is by faith that we receive it. We cannot get it any other way. And faith being that knowledge, agreement, and trust in God. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's a constancy in such a profession of faith that keeps things alive, isn't it? It's a constancy even in other areas of life, I mean business life, if business stops, then what else stops? Just about everything, doesn't it? If somebody doesn't trade with somebody else, everything stops. If we believe but we don't continue therein, then that is in danger of also stopping. So the constancy of faith is very, very important. By faith, by grace rather, are you saved through faith, Ephesians 2.8. Yes, the salvation is designed and uh, you know, put into play and carried out fully by God himself. You and I had nothing whatsoever to do with it. But once that completed package, if you will, was completed, it was given to mankind to accept by trusting. Faith is trust. Remember the Greek word is pistis, which means total trust in God. And the real faith, faith is tested, folks. Your faith is tested every day. I know mine is. It's tested by devils and demons, sometimes at night, sometimes just because I'm in traffic, sometimes otherwise. It is tested by other human beings, <coughs> certainly that come against the faith in God. It is tested by, tested rather by false teachings, silly teachings about evolution and other such nonsense that never happened. It is tested by what they call science. Or Paul calls it, they who falsely call it knowledge. Science is knowledge, right? Well, there's a false knowledge. And we've got to be very careful not to fall into that because the bottom line is either you believe in God or you don't. There is no middle ground. 
We cannot halfway believe and so forth. The good thing is, and the most wonderful thing, we just sang a bunch of verses in several songs, and that's why these songs are so important. That God does everything in His power. And of course, He has all power, but He does everything in His power to further your faith, to bring you to it in the first place, to further it, to bolster it, to strengthen it, to deepen it, to widen it, to increase it, to however you want to say it. But what is the one thing he cannot do? He cannot override your will because that's what he wants in return. Your will is demonstrated by your faith in him. It must be your will and your will alone. And this is why he bolsters it. There's no excuse once we come to God to then somehow let that one go. Or let it ebb away. Because what happens when you don't see somebody for a while? I know this happens to me. Acquaintances and, and even brothers and sisters in the Lord. Once you don't see them for a while, you sort of don't pray for them all the time anymore. It becomes less and less. You don't think about them very much. It becomes less and less. Not because you don't love them. Not because you don't want to. It's just a fact that happens. If you're into a physical work, physically working out and you know, maybe competing somewhere in a race or gymnastics or whatever it may be, you have to continually train, don't you? What happens if you don't train? You get rusty. You get slow. You get weak. You can't stretch anymore like you used to. And the whole time we're doing this, we have an enemy called age. <laughs> You're fighting it all the time. You younger ones don't yet know the impact in which some of us older ones know this impact. But it is nonetheless a fact. And one of the, one of the things about young people, whatever a, once the age of accountability is reached, you know, somewhere between... 8 and 13, I guess. It depends on, uh, God knows exactly in each individual, but you and I don't know. But it's somewhere in there where everybody's going to be accountable. And maybe even sooner for some people. You know right from wrong. Your conscience is with you. And you know not to do something, do something. Once that age, what, what, however it comes, or whenever it comes for any individual, is reached, we are responsible for it. <laughs> You and I are responsible for it. And this is why God nurtures us and says, yes, keep going, keep running. Yes, I know it's tough. But guess what? It's okay. <laughs> Don't quit believing and you'll make it. In fact, in eternity, it's already yours. But in time, you've got to live it out. You've got to live it out until you get that prized possession. That crown of life, hallelujah. Go with me to Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. Now he's speaking to believers and he's saying, For I say through the grace of given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. This is believers. Unbelievers don't necessarily have this. <coughs> so we've been dealt a measure of faith. How does... Or rather, how do the things of the spirit and soul grow, such as love, such as affection, such as faith? They grow with time. They get deeper and more important. And some say this happens to wine. You know, an aged wine is considered high dollar. Anyone who has true wisdom... Of course, God can just impart it. Bang, there it is. And if you need such a thing, 
in God, within God's will, He will do that for each and every one of us. You'll have the wisdom exactly what you need, when and how you need it. However, the constant wisdom that should come more and more as you live through life, as you continue your walk with Christ, as your faith grows, if you will. And let me stop there. Faith doesn't grow as in size. You don't have faith that's like this. It's, we say little faith, much faith, deep faith, shallow faith. But those things are not real. Those things are only what? Those things are descriptions, the best way we know how in our language to do just that. Okay? So what we need to understand is that faith grows in quality. Quantity has nothing to do with it. There's a quality of faith. When you give your life to God, that's a pretty good quality. Now to stay there is even more quality. And to stay there under persecution is even more quality. And to stay there under heavy persecution like your life do. You're actually bleeding. You've got nothing left that you can say is yours. They've taken your home. They've taken your family. They've taken everything you got. And you still trust God. Now that's a different kind of faith altogether, isn't it? But only in quality. Some of us have this quality without having to go through the rest of it. Others of us need to find out just where our quality faith is. How, quali how, you know, uh, how well did our faith develop? How good a faith do we have, to put it bluntly? Is it that kind of a quality that will still be there when everybody else has fallen? That will still be there when I can barely breathe and walk? Some disease got on me? Some accident happened to me? Some terrorist got a hold of me? Some criminal? Is my faith still there then? That's what counts. This thing about obedience, and I really like the fact that, you know, we, we, all, we like to think that uh, Jill picks out the songs for each Sunday and she prays about it and so forth and goes over it. And, and none of this is light. Some of you may think we just, oh, we'll just do this. Too. That's never how it has happened. It's never how it's going to happen as far as I can tell. And we never correspond with one another. What are you going to do? I have asked her a time or two, what songs are we doing today? Just because I wanted to know. Maybe on the way over here or somewhere. Okay. But there's no collaboration other than that. But this whole idea of obedience in the song Trust and Obey that we sang today, it lines it out from, from the very first stanza all the way to stanza five. It lines out exactly what's going on, as most of these songs do. And this is, again, why we sing those songs and praise God. The obedience has to do with faith, not which individual little thing am I going to obey in. If we are obedient in trusting the Lord God, then the other little things are a byproduct thereof. There's no way around it. It is a fact, it is a truth. <coughs> Go with me to 1 Timothy 6.12, please. I want to bring out a point there. Fight the good fight of faith, Timothy, says Paul. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession or the gospel in the presence of many witnesses. Timothy was a young preacher. Many put him down for his youth and didn't think he had the wisdom it took, but here's one of those occasions where a young man who had not lived the years did have the wisdom because of his upbringing and because of Paul, who adopted him as a spiritual son. And so he's telling Timothy, and this is called an, uh, an, uh, uh, 
uh, this epistle of Timothy and Titus as well are called pastoral epistles, or the letters to pastors to teach us, you know, how to set up uh, the body of rulership and church, uh, what's it take to, to be a, a leader, an elder, and there are qualifications that Paul tells Timothy because he's about to set up a church, you see, and he's training him in how to do this. And so towards the end of this first uh, letter to him, he says, fight the, good faith of, uh, fight the good fight of faith. And this word fight here is more contended. It's not a, 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 a battle like on, a, on a, a war battle, like on a battlefield. This is more like running a race, winning a competition. Okay? And it goes in line with uh, what the Jude said. I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but... There's so many false teachers out there, so much trash going on. I want to remind you to contend for the faith. Run your race because you can't run someone else's race and I can't run yours and you can't run mine. You cannot run your children's race. You cannot run your husband or wife's race. You cannot run your girlfriend or your fiance's race. Everyone has to run their own race in this faith. Why? Because faith is personal. And up close and in your face. And it's this faith that it takes to receive this grace, which is the gospel, the forgiveness of our sins. He did the work, but is everybody saved? No. Only those who have faith. <laughs> Only those who exercise pistis, the knowledge, agreement, and trust of what God said and did. You see? And so we have this longevity in faith, and, but it needs to be nurtured. We have this contention that we need to contend with. We need to compete with whom? With ourselves, with our own doubts. Our own shortcomings in this. I've had more than one brother or sister in the Lord over the years tell me of their doubts because they did something in the past and they weren't sure about God's forgiveness. Well, the Bible is clear. If you have faith in God and in the gospel of Christ, that thing is done and over with. The Bible is also very clear that any recent sins we do because we're in time, we're living day by day, as the first, or first John 1 John 1.9, we ought to confess them. They were paid for 2,000 years ago at the cross. The deal was made. But for us to get rid of it, to cleanse our minds, confess them to God and agree with Him, and that's what confession is. The Greek word means agree with God. And it's all tied in with pistis, that word, which also is agreement, you see. It's a wonderful thing. All we got to do is trust God. And again, it's about trusting God or not trusting God. And when you don't trust God, guess what? You're still trusting. Wow, what are you trusting? You're trusting the lie. You either trust God, who is truth, or you trust the lie. Either way, you trust. If you trust yourself, you're trusting the lie. If you trust you know, the false teachers, you're trusting a lie. If you trust in your abilities, you're trusting a lie. If you trust in information and knowledge, you're trusting a lie. You can only trust in God. Does not the world say, I believe it when I see it? <laughs> Paul, the Bible, through Paul, <coughs> excuse me, especially, that's complete opposite of what biblical truth is. Paul says, once you see it, why would you still believe it? You don't need to believe in it. The believing comes before you see it. Because God's word is truth and he cannot lie. You understand that? He cannot. Oh, God can do anything. Yeah, but he cannot lie. He cannot override your will. Does he have power to do that? Of course. But he cannot because of his character of justice. And he gave you that free will. The greatest gift you guys got was your free will. Somebody would argue, well, the greatest gift is you. Of course he is. But how do we get that? <laughs> Faith to choose. I've used this example before. 
between husband and wife, if Jill married me because she thought she had to, or she was some kind of obligation to it, I would not have her in her own free will. But as it was, she chose me. <laughs> Get a little dramatic there. We're working on 29 big ones this uh, in a couple of months. Ow. Yeah, I was right. It has to be a free will offering from your spirit and soul. Said, I want you, God. I want the salvation. I want you, woman, as wife or husband, whichever. Or the thing isn't real. You don't have a real relationship. You see? Relationship is something built on what? Trust. <clears throat> to live in and by faith in God is constantly brought up in the New Testament in relation to Christ's second coming. We are to stand before Him when He comes in purity and clean. Now who's going to raise their hand if I say you're there now? Well, you all should if you're believers. See, it doesn't matter what you said an hour ago or the fight you had last night or whatever else you did that wasn't quite right. None of that matters. What matters is do you trust God? Well, then all hands should go up. Will you stand before God when Christ comes? Will he find faith in the world, the Bible says? Well, yeah, in his church, <laughs> in his assembly, in his ecclesia. Ow! Ow! Makes me want to do a little two-step moonwalk, but the carpet's going to drag on my feet. <laughs> See, that's good news. That's good news. Something Neil Armstrong should have done huh? back in the 60s. He should have moonwalked. <laughs> if you're too young, Neil Armstrong was the first man who walked on the moon, according to NASA. Okay. <clears throat> I say it again. If our obedience is in place, our obedience to God means believing Him. That's what it means. Having faith in Christ and His gospel. That's what it means. And if that's in place... Our conduct will follow. Yeah, will it fall short at times? Of course. Will it be totally wrong at other times? Of course. Will it be right on sometimes? Yeah. I've experienced it all. Have you? Huh? Huh? Yes. Huh? <clears throat> Robert W. Ross says, The danger of apostasy, and apostasy, to remind you, is falling from the faith. There are those who say, let me quickly, before I do that quote, I want to reiterate this. I fail to see how someone can fall from something they don't have. Or fall from a table that you're not sitting on top of. Okay, there are those who say, well, those, those who are only, only people who can apostify, apostasy are those who don't really have it. That doesn't even make any sense. So with that in mind, I like uh, Ross's statement that de concerning Hebrews 10.23. We'll go there in a minute. The danger of apostasy lurks in the failure of believers to meet together for mutual help, mutual encouragement. I know that there are reasons, like Brian can't make it today. I need to pray for Brian and, and uh, his family, his wife and others. Uh, just that God will bless them in, in health and, and all the rest of it, and all his travels for safety and so on. But if we willingly forsake the assembling of ourselves, the coming together on Sunday morning, for instance, or Bible study or something like that, but especially Sunday morning, the official meeting time for the church. 
and that's because of Acts, the apostles met on Sunday morning, and so forth. It has nothing to do with Roman Catholicism, which claims they led the practice into being they did not. It is a lie from the pit. If we forsake that, then something else is wrong. Somewhere our faith is waning. Somewhere our faith is being polluted. Watered down, not as strong. It's one of the first signs when people quit showing up for meetings with other believers. And so we need to continue and this is why we have the Q&A afterwards. It's a part of admonishing one another, lifting one another up. And like the rest of society, much of the church, including this little group, sometimes is just too introverted and we don't want to say anything, you know, and, and uh, I don't want to burden anybody with this. Or uh, Then on the other hand, there are times when people go overboard with their, you understand what I'm saying? We need to have the wisdom to keep the thing real. Stay in the middle of that thing. If you got a problem, you let your church brothers and sisters know so we can pray for you at the very least. And if you don't hang out regularly, there's a waving going on. There's a waving going on. In James, we learn that we, sh we shouldn't be Tossed to and fro from with every wind of doctrine, but it also means with every you know. Well, don't feel good today. Don't want to go today. Da 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 da. This kind of stuff. It happens, and there are legitimate you know reasons. But we must meet together regularly to keep each other strong in this what in this faith that has what that has quality. Anyone says, "Hey, oh, I believe I." Believe. That's not quality anything. Would you, would you hire a person like that to do something for you? <laughs> and we'll put in a pool. It's an example. Am I going to hire someone who says they can dig a hole? I don't think so. I'd hire somebody who's already built pools, who's well on the way of knowing all about pool building. You understand? Installing and so forth. The only way a newcomer should be a part of that is because they're with someone who does know their stuff. And they're learning. That's what apprenticeship is all about. And that's going by the way too, so by the wayside. In the early days, apprenticeship was an important deal. That's how you learned. In fact, you paid the master to learn the craft. And then after three, four, five, sometimes 10, 12 years, depending on what it was and who your master was, whatever they decided. I'm talking as a master carpenter, master baker, master whatever, a profession, okay? They would then qualify you. And everyone that knew, hey, he studied under so-and-so, just like it says about Paul, he studied the law uh, in, the, in the Torah under Gamaliel, one of the highest, highly respected Jewish scholars. This is why one reason I suspect why Paul was chosen by God, because Paul already had the training. He knew the Greek, he knew the, the Hebrew, he knew the Aramaic. He knew the law. He knew Greek philosophy. You see, he could talk about anything and tell you truth because he already understood. So our faith needs to have quality, quality faith. Without it, it may flutter by. Without it, you don't really care if you come or not come. Without it, can you be sure of having received the gift? Ooh, it's about that, isn't it? Acts 14.22 says, Continue in the faith. We've come to do all this. <clears throat> the apostle said, You continue in the faith. Why? That's how you get salvation and keep it. Now, some say, Now, Walt, when you say that, it sounds like you have to work for it. No, I've never said that. And those of you that know me know this. You cannot work for it. It's a free gift. And you do get it right then and there. The moment you make that confession. But is the confession real? That's the whole point. See? Is it real? 
And if it's real, you'll know it's real because your life will have changed and others will have seen it. Now, in some of you, though your lives won't be so visible, so, so shockingly visibly seen. Usually in our day and age, it's the druggie, the drunk, the scum bucket, the low life that was obviously that, and then now they're not. But there are those people who weren't those things. But they still weren't saved. They had no quality faith to receive this salvation. How do you tell that difference? First and foremost is for them to know the difference first. Remember, this is a very individual thing. Faith is individual. <clears throat> when mercy is rejected, judgment must fall. This is for all those who have knowledge of the truth. And the word in the Greek is full, complete knowledge. You lack nothing. And yet, you let it slip by. You let it wane. You didn't accept it. Or you did a little bit, like Mark 4.4, 4, the four soils. Some of us receive it. Yes, oh, hallelujah, I love it, I love it, I love it. But then, as the cares of the world come, it goes away, draws us away. Others get it so little that they don't know if they love it or not. Oh, they know it, but they don't know if they haven't decided yet. I'm undecided about this one. And out of the four soils, the ones who get a little, the ones who get it and let it go, and then the ones who get it don't let it go, but still the more testing, and they did let it go because the root wasn't deep enough. How do you get a deep root? You've got to know this. I said something about it, I think, maybe last week, or maybe it was Bible study. The pages are falling out of this one, and I have several marked up Bibles, and I'm about to get another one. Uh, I'm looking for a special thing that I'm looking for. And it'll be marked up too. That's just how I do things. I want to highlight, underline, put my personal notes in there. I want to know the most I can know. Not to get something. I already got it. I got the faith, but I'm making it more quality for me. You got to make it more quality for you. Because in the end, is God about quality? Yeah, he is quality. To the max. And we need to really understand in as much as we can and then trust that understanding once it's verified by the Holy Spirit. And how do we verify it by the Holy Spirit? He uses this, the written word. This is why people who say, well, I... I believe because I feel it. You know, the experiential number is so prevalent today in the TV preachers and all the rest of it. Your experience says nothing about true faith. Do you know that? Your experience says nothing about it. It cannot, ever. It must come from doctrine. Out of the 21 or two times that doctrine is mentioned, 19 is in the books of Timothy and Titus by Paul because he's teaching them pastoral things. <clears throat> now, do many of you know most of what I've said? Of course you do. This is not new. It's by way of reminder. I remind myself all the time. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. Listen up. While we do His good will, He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Many people read this, oh, I've got I to gotta be good here and I've got to be good there and I, gotta, I can't sin over here. And I gotta, that's not what it means. It means <clears throat> keep your faith intact in quality. And if you work on keeping the quality of your faith at a very high standard, 
the highest you can get to, the stuff that falls underneath that is a done deal. You will not lie and cheat and smoke and chew and run with those who do. And the rest of it. No need. Why? You got faith in God. He said, I'll supply all you need. Didn't he? Well, is he? Was he kidding? Was he playing you? Is he setting you up? Will God tempt you? No. Can he be tempted? No. Who's the tempter? Satan. Satan. The truth or the lie? Which are we going to believe? The truth or the lie? Which <clears throat> directs our lives? Well, some people, they allow their lives to be directed by a supposed fusion of the two. Because they don't quite want to let go of the world. Let you and I be not like that. Being a true biblical Christian has nothing to do with being a Miss Goody Two-Shoe or a Mr. Goody Two-Shoe. It has everything to do with having faith in God. <laughs> Trusting God for everything you need, for everything you think, say, and do. To the best of my ability, I've done that since I've received the gospel and got justified by his mercy and grace and so have you Why? recognize for your own selves and constantly be on the lookout for that which steals your time steals your attention and therefore steals your allegiance and therefore if you're not careful steals your love in Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians. I'm sorry, not Ephesians. Go to Revelation chapter 2. I want to bring this out. We talked about it in Bible study, but this, this is on point. The book of the Revelation, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 2. Are you there? Yes. To the angel of the church of Ephesus. Ephesus means darling or desired one. That's what the word means. Listen to what he says. God has a, a, a talking to the seven churches. That's a whole other teaching, but I just want to bring this out. He has all these things. Uh, two and following. Jesus is talking. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And I said it in Bible study, and we agreed. Now I'm saying, is that us? Yeah. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them liars. This will be the false teachers and all the garbage out. Don't line up with the word of God. Nevertheless, or rather, verse 3, and you have persevered. Wow. You've had patience. Wow. And have labored for my namesake and have not become weary. Is that you? Yeah, it's a little less decisive, isn't it? <laughs> wow. Now look what he says now. All this good stuff, serious stuff, personal sacrifice. Then Christ says this, Nevertheless, despite all that stuff, I have this against you. Whoa. That you have left your first love. Therefore, or remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you and quickly remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And that will be the church itself. Folks, if you have waned in your first love to God, if he's somehow second, even if you wouldn't say it. If I ask you, is, is Jesus Christ second in your life? Most of us would want to say at least, and maybe would say, oh no, he's number one. That's what we do. But is that a quality answer? Or is it a 
convenient answer? Or do we want to, you know, slight embarrassment somehow, especially in front of one another? Folks, that's why we come together as believers to iron this out, to, 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 to say, wait a minute here. If anyone has that, let's know it so we can pray about it and say, hey, forget it. He's already paid for that sin too. First love is a love that has no conditions. First love is a love that <clears throat> puts Christ number one in every single thing. And it comes back down to obedience. If we trust God, if we obey with our faith, that's how we really obey. Our doing don't always obey. We already figured that out, haven't we? How many obeyed 100% Christ even just this morning? And I wasn't raising my hand. I was only doing this to get your attention. <laughs> it's a good thing that you and me are alike. I'm a sinner saved by grace, but I am saved by grace because I believe it. And yet I still sin. And I hate it. I, have, I really do. And I know you do. Paul did, and he said, he said, who's going to set me free from this nonsense? I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do. Ah, Jesus Christ. Glory to him. Hallelujah. Because he paid for it. <laughs> and we need to believe it. All we got to do is to really believe it. No uncertain terms, no ifs, ands, or buts, no screwing around with it. We believe it. Now, having said that, I got to regress a little bit to last week's teaching, and that is, it takes the doing. You can't just say we believe. We must do. James says that if you say you have faith, show me your faith. How are you going to do that? And he says, well, somebody might argue and say, well, you have faith and I have works. And then he says, okay, if you have works, then show me your faith by your works. The only way you can do it is to show it by the works. And if you go rob a gas station, is that proof of having faith in God? No. How about if you put yourself down, if you put yourself last, if you suffer a little bit to help somebody else or to make the situation better, if not fix it? Is that more like having faith, showing faith? Yeah. I'm talking daily life. I'm not talking anything that's so hard we can't do it. Jesus said, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. You can do this. You can trust me, and because you trust me, the outcropping of that trusting will be good works. And for those, I gather all them up, God says, and I have a record of it, and that's your account in heaven, and that's what you'll get paid for. I actually have a paycheck for you, all you, my children who believe. You don't do this for nothing. First of all, you're going to make it with me in everlasting life. That means everlasting love, true love. No sorrow, no tears, no nothing. Just complete, total bliss with God. People want to find this sort of state of being, you know, in the honeymoon. Or with some earthly thing. Some possible you know, profession or some status like Hollywood people, rock stars and the like. They, everyone's looking for this thing that God has already said here. It only comes from me. <laughs> Where else is it going to come from? Can't come from anywhere else. Only me. So trust me. All the way. No wavering. And when anything comes to your ears, knocking on your door or whatever, that speaks things that aren't in here or even against this, immediately turn your back. And you don't even have to say, see you later or toodaloo. You're just not doing it. You're done. You're breaking it off because that's the first thing, the first cut. You know, Rod Stewart, for those rock and roll fans of the 60s and 70s, Rod Stewart wrote a song called The First Cut is the Deepest. Absolutely true. Satan knows this. He was talking about, you know, a romantic relationship in a song and it's totally worldly. But my point here is the first cut is the deepest. If you allow Satan to cut you once really, really good, 
You're going to cower down to him? Or you're going to say, no, you know what? That really hurt, but I'm saved. I have faith in Christ and his gospel. Quality faith. Don't you know that those people in the concentration camps in World War II and the others that are happening now in places nobody wants to tell us about? And the whole ISIS thing, can you imagine being captured by ISIS? You know what's going to happen because they're not fooling around. And those Christians who have already suffered, and many are with the Lord, got their heads cut off or what have you, threw a little boy on a little, little, little kid, threw him on a fire and held his face down with his foot on a fire and said like a two, three-year-old kid who was going after his Bible, which they threw in a fire. It was a report that came out here a couple of weeks ago on VOM. He's all burned up. He lived through, but he's all burned up. Cute little guy, two, three years old. And, uh, and that little guy at that age didn't whimper or nothing. He just said, I want my Bible. He just come out of a, out of a, a, a Bible class. True, true story. And he's only one of many. And the guy with his foot on him called him a stubborn infidel. A stubborn unbeliever in Allah. What are you and I going to say? And that little guy who's got nothing already goes through that. You know where his hope had to have been? <laughs> Ow! In Jesus Christ! You know what, little guy? Go ahead and do that because I got stuff for you in heaven. Whoa. You understand? We, and I include myself, we don't get some of that because we're pampered. But the fact still is and remains until Christ comes that this world is evil and that peace is only a deception between two wars. That's all it is. The Bible says wars are determined to the end to the prophet Daniel. Peace is a period of deception between two wars. Never forget it. There'll be no two-state solution. The Bible already said once my people come back in the land, they're not giving it up. They'll never lose it again. It'll come close. According to Ezekiel 38 and 39, but God will step in at the last minute. Jerusalem will be taken. The women will be ravished, Zechariah says. And it will be very, very close. That's already happened many times, but this final time will be even worse. But God will step in. Because you know why? It's His land, not Israel's land. It's God's land. Do we get that? <laughs> you go to Jerusalem, you know it's God's land. You float on the Sea of Gethsemane like we've done, you know it's God's land. Everything belongs to God. Woo! It's his planet, though. All the cattle on a thousand hills and all the gold and silver are mine, God said. They're not yours, they're mine. And here people are hoarding gold and playing around and trading and putting values on and off. It all belongs to God. So if I've admonished anyone today, I hope I did. To work your faith, increase your faith in the sense that we talk in quality. Make it a quality faith. Get real. Because when the poop hits the fan, you better have some real quality faith. Whether it's your kids or your siblings or, you know, whatever it may be. We have a family member in Arkansas. They just operated a 12 or 8 hour, 9 hour operation on his brain. He, uh, Alan down there, we talked to you about it. We prayed for him already. All day operation just to, uh, to get rid of this tumor on his brain. He's only 46 or 7. Wow. And we hope he's going to make it. Now he's got to go through prob probably years of chemo and God only knows what else. And I have another uh, uh, brother in the Lord, and I know you wouldn't mind me saying so, that had throat cancer. And when they worked on him with chemo, they did away with the cancer, but they almost killed him. And now 
what's happening is it's all the chemo coming back out of his body, coming through his pores, literally. It's eating him up. He thanks God that he had the cancer. I'm talking about Jackson Morgan. Some of you know him. I was privileged to be one of the people who were in his life when he got justified. We worked together at a church at a construction company, and we worked together at the time on some projects. So we had a lot of personal time to and from the job and so on, speaking about the Lord. And, and it's an amazing thing. God restored not only him, his marriage, his family, his business. <laughs> it's amazing. Amazing. And he almost ended his life with uh, silliness. He's got a college degree. He's a very intelligent human being. And, he, and there's no doubt that he knows the Lord and that he loves the Lord. There's no doubt. No matter what we think about any of that, that comes through in his doing as well as his saying. And I don't want to, you know, I'm sitting here to pat his back or lift him up. He's one of many. You understand what I'm saying? But he's just a good example that kind of fits in with what I'm saying. He has quality faith. There's no doubt about it. I have confidence in that. And he has confidence in my quality faith, apparently, because uh, I like to say we call each other, but he mainly calls me because I space it out. And, you know, we talked about that last time. One time he called me and he said, talking about getting together, and I apologize for not calling him. This was two or three years ago. And he said, well... Uh, that works both ways. You know, the phone works both ways. And I said, you're right. And so, of course, I don't call him. <laughs> he calls me, you know, like every three or four or five months. It's been a while. It was last time. And I said, don't worry about it. He said, I just think about you, and I feel like when you come to mind, I want to call you. And that's what he does. And we have a good discussion for 10, 15, maybe half an hour sometimes. And we both love the Lord, and it's awesome. And uh, and it's like, it's like getting together in a meeting, you know. And... Uh, haven't seen him face to face for quite a while, but it doesn't matter. You see, it doesn't matter. Quality faith. Don't let your faith be so so, lollygag, or some run of the mill, what somebody calls faith. Let your faith be personal and quality in God and His gospel. That will be Jesus, who is the Christ. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, holy is your precious name, Lord. Thank you for this, this trust in you that you can instill and burn in us more and more as we trust you more and more, as we give ourselves up to you more and more. And it is just that. Letting go of self, letting go of the world. And when we do those things, Satan has nothing I mean nothing with which to accuse us or with which to hook us. Allow us to stay in your word, Lord. Give us more hunger. For you, do, you yourself declare that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will, will receive it. We got to hunger and thirst. We got to be diligent about wanting you about increasing our faith with quality. Thank you that you do everything for us to get that done. And if anyone fails, it's us. If anyone lacks, it's us. No one will stand before you and make an accusation. For if we failed, we failed ourselves. So thank you for your power. Thank you for your desire and love for us to come to you and allow us to make the best we can out of everything else around us, our everyday lives, in order to help others and to be a witness for you, Lord, in how we conduct ourselves, especially in times of trial and persecution. In Jesus' name, amen.